Okay, hello guys. So, of course, I don't want to make a, mm -hmm. a speech on the history of art in France and Europe. That's too vast. And anyway, I'm not the best person to talk about this. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's make it in a very, very short terms. I mean, France has always been, you know, the city and the, the country of, of lights, uh, meaning that many, many changes in culture uh, happened from France and then was propagated to the other countries of, of Europe mm -hmm. and, and to the world. And this is why Paris has always been the attraction of uh, culture oriented people and artists, etc. So, of course, uh, this tradition of uh, fine painting, fine art, you know, was dating back from, uh, you know, the uh, 15th, 16th century, etc., with a lot of influence actually from Italy, because also mm -hmm. Italy was excellent, you know, in developing Renaissance art, you know, back in the, in the 15th, 16th century. So uh, the two countries developed very good quality art that was, you know, divulgated to the world. And since then, uh, many, many famous painters developed until I would say the, the uh, wave of Impressionism uh, that's dating back at the end of the 19th century. These famous people like uh, Monet, Manet and many others. And of course, Paris has always been, you know, again, uh, a destination for rich people to travel, of mm -hmm. educated people, and uh, these people, you know, rich people from Russia or from England, you know, were coming to Paris to spend two, three weeks. You know, at that time, mm -hmm. it was not easy to travel. You couldn't catch a flight, so you took the ship, you know, and uh, you stayed three, four weeks each time, you know, or, or even more. For example, you know, where I'm calling from, actually I'm calling from Nice in, on the Riviera. And it's very famous that the British people during the British Empire, during Queen Victoria and, and after, were spending their summer vacations, you know, in, in, in the Riviera. Same for the Russians, you know. So at that time, <coughs> in the 19th century, many, many rich people, you know, uh, had um, a state in France and in Paris and purchased art and, and talked to artists, etc. So this is why this tradition of, uh, of art painting and sculpture is, is fairly developed and fairly well known around the world. Then came the wars, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the First World War and then Second World War, that, you know, of course, because of so much trouble uh, sparked, you know, some new uh, inspiration and new thoughts about life, about the future of humanity. And then you came up with um, other artists, other waves of artists being very much modern in their way of painting and mostly also in their way of expression because they wanted actually to pass messages to the world, you know, about philosophy, about humanity, about class struggle, because don't forget at that point in time also, there was socialism and communism coming up to the board, you know, so many artists have been influenced by this in their depiction of society and also of the uh, inequalities in society. Yeah. So you, you, you turn from a very, I would say, plastic art, you know, describing landscapes and maybe some life scene to something more politically oriented and if not politically also more uh, realistic about the problems in society and this wave you know was very successful and developed even further you know um, in certain places in France and Europe but talking about France especially on the Riviera when I'm sitting today, you know, because many artists found a way, you know, to spend good time in a way on the Riviera because the climate is much better, uh, the winter is very mild, etc. So they settled their studio and ateliers, you know, on the Riviera. And this is where actually they met and exchanged ideas and, and co-worked on some artworks, etc. So, this also became famous around the world because 
the Riviera was also a spot of vacation, as I was telling you, and still rich people used to gather on the Riviera to meet with artists and buy their art, you know, including Picasso, you know, including uh, many other famous artists. I'm not talking about uh, Dali, but Dali was Italian, maybe he spent some time in Nice also, but not so much. Mm -hmm. And then we turn to the 1960s, 1970s, where, you know, we, we can we can say that we turn to some more modern art. Um, modern art because everything became more abstract in a way, more geometric, more um, based on colors, sharp colors, colors contrast. And people were, you know, looking also experimenting, I would say new ways of painting uh mixing media uh mixing uh, uh video also because video was popping up at the same time and, and we can say that this is where contemporary art starts you know starting from the 1980s to up to now we are now talking about contemporary art mm -hmm. and of course contemporary art is mm -hmm. also moving along with time that means in 50 years from now i mean the contemporary art of 2000 70 will be different from the contemporary art of now that's for sure so having said this you know this is something interesting because this contemporary art also in europe and in france came up because always a new generation of artists tries new ways of expressing herself differently from the previous generation that means they find ways to be different and to make things their way, you know? And don't, re don't forget, you know, that at that point in time, in 1968, you know, there was a huge social movement created in France called Mai 68, I mean, May 68, where all the society basically was blown down, was, was blown away because all the traditional relationship in the society where uh, put to zero and uh, basically we became more equal more rights for young people for older people for workers you know so this is very very important because this may 68 revolution in france spread also around europe and this way of um, uh, uh, being against you know the current state of society of course was a source of inspiration for the artists, all sorts of artists, uh, trying to support actually the movement of the young people to change the way society was working. And this is why now uh, contemporary art is also a way of expression for the young generation of artists in Mongolia, because since the collapse of the USSR and since the collapse of the link between currently Russia and Mongolia, well, the young generation of artists try to express their feelings and their anxiety and their questioning about society and future and life in a new way, very, very different from the older well, artists. Well, yeah. So this is a fundamental period in Mongolia because we are just after the major change to a democratic society, to a sort to a a market economy and the other difficulty for this young generation is that in this uh, great change of society they are not supported anymore by the state before it was a case the state was supporting um, the artists was supporting their creation was most probably providing free workshop and support in buying materials etc now it's not the case anymore now the young artists are facing the harsh reality of trying to meet uh, both ends, you know, uh, to, to have enough income to pay for their life and to pay for their materials, you know, to buy paint and to buy pencils and to buy canvases, etc. So I would say these young artists have a harsh time to make it. Mm -hmm. Because the other difficulty now in Mongolia, because we now talk about Mongolia, is that 
the purchasing car in Mongolia is still weak, you know, so you don't have so many art buyers, art collectors. You have a few, but not so many. So it's difficult for a young artist to find their market, you know, to find people who can buy their art. So for the, for the ones, you know, who have connections through political persons or through business people, they can sometimes exhibit in the region, for example, in Beijing or in Seoul or in Tokyo, sometimes in Russia and Moscow, most often, you know, I would say in Irkutsk, Ulan Uda, in the close region, because it's cheaper and the connection they have lead them to those places. But it's very difficult for them to go to Venice, to go to Paris, to go to London, to go to Berlin, and even more difficult for them to go to New York or, uh, or Miami. You know? So we are at, a, at the crossroads, you know, where Mongolian contemporary art is powerful. Mm -hmm. They have very talented artists, but the problem is to find their fair share of the contemporary art market. Because actually it's a market. It's a market in which there is competition. There are lots and lots and lots of young artists around the world. Whatever country, you know, generates a population of artists that is also competing. And when you go to these art fairs or art markets around the world, you see all sorts of artists coming from around the world and trying to sell their art better than the neighboring artist who also tries hard to sell his art or her art. So it's a competitive market and also the young generation of Mongolian artists is not really um, adapted to this because they are still, I would say, in the creation mood, which is good, but they are not in a marketing mood. You know, they are not in a commercial mood, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. will be or will become important in some time that they have also this marketing and commercial understanding that they are in a market that is very competitive. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I didn't really heard about well, you know, before. I just read a little bit, but I didn't didn't really know about the this kind of stories which you told. As you know. Yeah. But in all this, I think, you know, the most important, the very, very most important is that there is quality art. Mm -hmm. Because I would not personally support Mongolian contemporary art if the quality was not good. Mm -hmm. I believe the quality is good enough and the talent is there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why I'm trying to support the young, talented generation of artists. Not all of them, of course, there are too many. And it's difficult also to select the good ones because I, I, would, I would say that a good artist is someone who has his own vision of how to express he, himself or herself. Yeah. I don't want people to copy others. It doesn't make any sense. These are not good artists. They are just copiers, you know. I want people who have their original way of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be in sculpture, it can be in painting, it can be in video, it can be in anything that's related to art, but they have to get their own to mm -hmm. be themselves. Okay. That's the most important. And we have also to get hardworking people. It's very important that the artists are hard workers mm -hmm. to always try to improve, to always try to find new inspiration, to, to also... Uh, complete you know the, the their paintings correctly because sometimes i find artists in mongolia you know they think their painting is finished well i don't think so because i have the experience of international markets and in international markets these art collectors they want very fine art you know they want something yeah. very well finished very nice trade mm -hmm. nice colors not something that is too too fast, you know, and uh, <clears throat> I sometimes complain that uh, the Mongolian artists do it too fast. They don't spend enough time to make it very perfect. So it's a, it's a stage of, uh, of learning, 
I'm mm -hmm. pushing them towards this to improve the quality of their art so that they can be on par with international artists in international mm -hmm. fairs. Mm. Sounds very fascinating. Yeah. It is fascinating. I mean, it's a lot of work in a way. I mean, you maybe not realize this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something where you are a coach, actually, of people. You are a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you try to convince them slowly and gently that mm -hmm. they can improve this part of their work. They can improve uh, their inspiration. They can change a little bit their style so that, you know, it doesn't get boring either, you know. Yeah. Because... <laughs> you cannot buy, you know, always, for example, horses and horses and horses. Sometimes the art buyers, they want horses and dogs or they want horses and, and, and people, you know, but not only horses in the landscape. Yeah. So it, it's, it's very simple to say, you know, but sometimes the artists, they don't even think of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, I would say the Mongolian art, I just read a little bit, Mongolian painting began to develop more two years, uh, 2,000 years ago, isn't it? Two, sorry, yeah. say it again. Mongolian painting began to yeah. develop more than 2,000 years ago from simple oh, yeah, yeah. rock drawings, simple rock yeah, drawings. Yeah, true. That's true, true in a way yeah but this is a history of humanity you know yeah. <laughs> I mean, is it really hard i don't know i mean it's it was a first form of expression you know on stones mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah the Uyghur, Uyghur paintings yeah. of the 8th, 8th, yeah. 8th century proved that art was sure. yeah that's true right yeah so that's very interesting you know and when i so, read to um, when I visited your art gallery in the Mongolia in Ulaanbaatar, so it was yep. completely beautiful. And when I visited for several times, when I visited there, I just saw this amazing, inspirational, kind of motivational. It's just, it seems to me, just it shows, it makes people more like motivational, more, they're more excited from the nature, from the things where the draw the stuffs and it's all included many of these inspiration um, inspiration motivational kind of this impressive feeling the moods right yeah that's true um there, there is something i must say here i mean in my position as director of, of Altaham gallery you know mm -hmm. i would say unfortunately my my mission is actually to support the artists in helping them sell to the yeah. West. So this mm -hmm. is why I'm very much interested in, in the commercial value of the paintings of what they do of their creation. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because sometimes, you know, I, I can find good artists, but mm -hmm. their creation is, I would say, too Mongolian. Uh, it's not despising. It says that actually it's related to some culture of tradition of Mongolia that is very specific, I would say, of Mongolia. But then it's difficult for people in the West to understand it. So if people in the West doesn't, don't understand it, then they, they won't buy because if they don't understand, they generally won't buy. So this is why when I select artists and uh, select their artworks, I, I'm trying to choose something mm -hmm. that has, of course, some Mongolian content. Of course, it has to get some Mongolian content, but not too much. Otherwise, people in the West would not understand it. You see? Yeah. So it means that actually in what I'm doing, I'm not covering the whole spectrum of Mongolian art. Of course not. It's too wide. It's too vast. And they are, for example, I give you another example. Uh, some of the artists, you know, are very much spiritual and okay. very much, very much close to Buddhism or yeah. to relation with Buddha, Buddha's words, etc. Well, it's interesting when you know Mongolia. It's interesting, but to the West again, we are kind of far from Buddha. You know, I mean, we, 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 it's not in in our part of tradition and culture, Buddha. You know, mm -hmm. so this is the kind of thing. I would find difficult to sell in Europe. Of course, I might find some buyers, you know, who are Buddhist and they would buy it, but 
yeah. generally speaking, it's not the kind of thing they would buy. Mm -hmm. So also, you know, um, you have also Mongolian artists who want to be more modern, more abstract. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. You know, I do respect this. But if you put yourself two minutes in, in, in my shoes, you know, I mean, this is a way to say it. I mean, you would be, for example, trying to sell Mongolian abstract painting in Europe. Yeah. I mean, it would be difficult because you say, okay, this is a good painter, he's abstract, and he's from Mongolia. And then the buyer would say, oh, okay, I thought he was from Russia or from England or from Italy. You know, what's the difference? If there is no Mongolian content mm -hmm. in the painting, then you as an art trader, uh, it's, it's difficult for you to sell it saying, okay, it comes from Mongolia, but it's not big added value. So I think the only added value that you bring when you come from a Mongolian gallery, bringing Mongolian art, is that in the painting or in the artworks, mm -hmm. there is some Mongolian content. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I just need to make this down. Okay. Yeah. And to finish this, you know, you still have some painters, you know, young painters, because they <laughs> love nature, etc. Mm -hmm. They paint landscapes. Okay. Well, fine, but a landscape in Mongolia is not so exciting to people in the West, you know, because if they have not been to Mongolia, I mean, if you show the Gobi, people in Paris, London, or Milan, you know, wouldn't appreciate the mm -hmm. view of a Gobi desert, you know. For them, it doesn't talk to them. It talks to people in Mongolia. It talks to foreigners living in Mongolia. It talks to Russians. It talks to Chinese, maybe but not to people in London, Milan, or Paris, because they have not been there. It, it, it's just a landscape. But if you start talking about the life and the society and the traditions of Mongolian people, nomadic culture, and the fights of the young generation and the social problems in Mongolia, yes, that's interesting to them. Oh, wow. Because that's it's closer. To her it's closer to what, to what they know. It's closer mm -hmm. to what they had fought for. Okay. It's closer to what they think of, you know. Yeah, that's correct. I really think it's really right. Yeah. yeah. Something new uh, lets them know about something or their reality, right? Yes. Reality and, and real problems in society or real feelings. You know, love can be an excellent theme of inspiration for artists. Mm -hmm. and, and it's great and I support it as long as there is some Mongolian content in it. Yeah. And nomadic life is fine. I mean, Mongolian culture is a nomadic, a nomadic culture. It's still good to promote and support the nomadic culture. It's mm -hmm. good to support, you know, the love of Mongolian people for nature, mother nature and the animals. It's perfect. It's great. Mm -hmm. This I support, but I'm not going to support, you know, something that's, uh, totally abstract or totally religious or totally something like this, you know, because mm -hmm. then the Western people wouldn't understand it. Mm. Having said this, you know, there are uh, many galleries in Ulaanbaatar. I think yeah. my account tends at like 12, 12 galleries. Mm -hmm. But in this, I include UMA, you know, Union of Mongolian Artists, which is basically an institution. Mm -hmm. that used yeah. to belong to the state of Mongolia before, you know, uh, yeah. supporting artists, but now it's more or less an association of Mongolian artists, uh, meaning that they have uh, an obligation in a way <coughs> to let their members exhibit mm -hmm. uh, one week or two weeks every, every two years or three years because there are so many artists who are members of the association. And then you get private galleries and one of them, uh, but I would say not because I'm, I'm, I'm the owner of the gallery, but as a matter of fact, you know, we are one of the most active galleries in Ulaanbaatar because I realize that most galleries are, have actually a very nice space. For mm -hmm. example, MN17 or, you know, any other big galleries are very nice space, you know, mm -hmm. very good yeah. premises, but they only organize uh, exhibitions from time to time. And when they don't have any exhibition, the place is just closed, you know. So it, it's not so good because it, it doesn't give an expression of, uh, you know, activity all, all year round. We are open all year round. 
and we are trying to develop exhibitions not only in Ulaanbaatar uh, but also in foreign countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already exhibited three times if I'm not wrong in, in Europe mm -hmm. and I'm preparing a new exhibition and that's a big one in uh, Belgium okay. at the beginning of August from the 8th to the 16th of August in a place called Knokke, mm -hmm. Knokke Heist. It's in the Flanders region. It's a rich region of Belgium, close to the Netherlands. And I will exhibit like four or five artists. Mm -hmm. I will exhibit paintings. I will exhibit uh, porcelain from Tamir, you know, the uh, Mongolian calligrapher, yeah. who made these uh, porcelain vases. Maybe you have seen them when, when you visited the gallery. Uh, so we try to sell them in, in Belgium and I have also the, the opportunity and I'm very, very happy about it to exhibit the sculptures of a Mongolian artist who is like 50 years old and uh, she's based actually in Sita near Eindhoven in the Netherlands. So she's a sculptor. She, she makes very nice uh, sculptures of earthware. Uh, <laughs> of uh, goddess Tara mm -hmm. or uh, Mongolian women and they are very nice very nice I hope we can sell a few of those mm. so it's going to be a quite uh, interesting exhibition especially that the organizer were very much interested to have for the first time ever a Mongolian gallery exhibiting in the affair they have had, you know, Korean, they have had Japanese, they have Chinese, but it's the first time a Mongolian gallery exhibits at their place. Oh. So they were very eager to get me join the fair, you know, and uh, exhibit Mongolian art. And I think there will be a lot of uh, report on the media, on the newspaper, on television about our presence at the fair. So this will be a good communication, you know, for the Mongolian art and Mongolian artists. I see even, even if we don't sell anything, at least we will have succeeded in communication. Yeah, that's, that's true. I see. Okay. So our talking is going to be finished in two minutes. So I will leave you the last question. Well, okay. I mean, can I ask the question? <laughs> please. Please ask. Okay, so some people don't really understand what's the museum, art museum, and art gallery. So what's the difference of them? Can you tell me? Can you tell to people? Well, I think the very first difference that pops to my mind is that a, an art gallery is generally commercially oriented. Mm -hmm. We have to sell because we have no support from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, in general, private entrepreneurs. It's our own money. It's our own business. So we have salaries. We have rents to pay. We have media cost, communication mm -hmm. cost. So we have to sell. An art museum is generally supported by the region, the city, or the state government in general. Not always. Okay. Uh, and because of this support, they can afford not to sell. So in general, they don't have exhibition for sale. They just exhibit artworks because it's one of the mission mm -hmm. of the Ministry of Culture or the city of Ulaanbaatar, just to, to give this example, to uh, create some cultural activity in the city, mm -hmm. to try to get interest on this young generation of artists that is culturally interesting, but without any attempt of selling their artworks. Of course, the artists can find benefit in this, yeah. because as long as they get known Mm -hmm. then people can get back to them and try to buy from them. So it's always good for the artist. Actually, the, the most important wish of an artist is to get seen, mm -hmm. to get his artworks or her artworks seen by the people. If they stay in their studio, it's not good. Nobody can see it, no good, nobody can buy it. So what they love is to have their artworks exhibited anywhere, in an yeah. art museum or in an art gallery. I see. That's a very good answer. Okay. Thank you so much for talking.